You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by professors Carrie McCarowitz, Prentice Stansler, and Arlie Atkins. They talk with us about their paper in the journal Housing Policy Debate that takes a closer look at how households with varied incomes spend on housing and transportation based on location. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thank you infinitely for supporting the show. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the numerous projects of the overhead wire, our 14 year old daily newsletter, where you can sign up for a two week free trial by going to the overhead wire.com and our audiobook production of Raymond Owen's 1909 classic town planning in practice. Pick it up and listen to it as a podcast by going to theoverheadwire.com or RaymondUnwin.com. Before we get to this week's show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both this show, Talking Headways, and Mondays at the Overhead Wire, where this music I'm talking about comes from, on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Subscribe today. Carrie McCarowitz, Prentice Danzler, and Arlie Adkins, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Well, thanks for being here. Before we get started, can you all tell us a little bit about yourselves? We'll start with Carrie and we'll go with Prentice and then Arlie. Sure. I'm an urban planning professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I've been here a little over seven years. And before that, I worked at the Center for Neighborhood Technology, where we developed the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index. I am a current assistant professor at Urban Studies Institute at Georgia State here in Atlanta. Before this, I was a sociology professor at Colorado College. And most of my work focuses on housing affordability and residential mobility issues. And I'm Arlie Adkins. I'm an associate professor of urban planning at the University of Arizona. I also have an appointment in the College of Public Health. And my research primarily focuses on looking at health and safety disparities of transportation systems. Nice. So I I want to kind of dive in a little bit more to you all personally in terms of like what got you into transportation and what got you into cities overall before you, you know, you went to school and started researching. So... When I graduated from from college, one of our graduation speakers at the University of Oregon was an urban planner. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, why didn't I know that this was a thing for my four years of undergraduate? And then sort of slowly after college, moved my way towards transportation and planning and ended up working for TriMet in Portland, the transit agency there. And I'm doing a lot of work with planning and community affairs and decided I wanted to kind of take that in a, in a different direction and went to UC Berkeley for a master's degree. And that's where I met Carrie when she was doing her PhD there and really, you know, wasn't planning on doing this, but really kind of caught the, the research bug there and decided that a lot of the questions and concerns that I'd had when I was working in the transit agency really needed some sort of different ways of looking at things that research was really suited to trying to unpack. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. So I originally started out in graduate school as a housing scholar. Most of my work has really kind of been looking at social welfare programs and impact on changing communities and also changing neighborhoods. So for me, housing has been kind of the the center by which I can understand other issues. More recently, I have been branching out and kind of understanding other affordability issues for people in their homes in their neighborhoods. So this it led to kind of think about transportation policy, but also I'm working with some other people around energy costs as well. So really thinking about the different ways where families are really kind of undergoing different causes of uh, cost burdens at the household level. And meeting Carrie a few years ago, or I guess a five years ago at this point, really thinking through some of the issues through a, a colleague and jumped at the chance to work with her and Arlie as well. So yeah, it's been a great experience to kind of really think about the role of housing but it's kind of connections to transportation and other cost burdens for families. I've been interested in cities for as long as I can remember. I grew up in Michigan in the 70s and 80s, you know, a Rust Belt city. And I just remember going to visit my relatives in Detroit out the window and seeing urban decline. And each year it got worse. And I wondered for years what caused that and what can be done to reverse 
shuttered factories and abandoned homes and poor infrastructure. So I studied community and economic development in my master's program in planning because it's like Arlie, it took me a while to find out that there's a whole field that studies cities. <laughs> I had actually studied business undergrad thinking that if what I saw was these shuttered factories, then the solution is to help these businesses recover, not realizing that you know, the business world that isn't as focused on that as the urban studies world is. So for me, transportation really is a subset of community and economic development and the well-being of individuals. You know, like our, like Prentice was describing, you know, it's a factor of, of an important factor of life. And so if people don't have good transportation, all types of transportation, then it really affects their job opportunities and where they can live and what their kids can get access to. Yeah, and that's something that comes up in the paper to a certain extent, and, and we'll get into that. I guess we should just kind of jump in, as as it were. So I want to talk with you guys about your paper, Another Look at Location Affordability, Understanding the Detailed Effects of Income and Urban Form on Housing and Transportation Expenditures. I'm curious what the impetus was for writing this paper. So I actually wanted to use the PSID for a long time, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics data that we used. I have a friend who I met at Michigan undergrad, and he did his PhD on household consumer expenditure patterns and went on to do a PhD in that field, worked at the Federal Reserve, and I was talking to him about the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index. And he said, you have to use the panel study of income dynamics. That's the data I use. And you'll see all these people's transportation and housing expenditures. Well, then Mike Smart and Nick Klein beat me to it. And they looked at the PSID data for location affordability. And when I read their paper, I felt, felt like they were missing something. When they found that there was were little to no effect of the urban form on household expenditures. And... As Prentice noted, we had met through a mutual friend. We were both in Denver. We were at the Urban Affairs Association conference. And I told him I really wanted to do this kind of a response piece. And given his housing expertise, his statistical analysis work, and his interest in other household expenditures, it was a perfect fit. And then we also brought in Arlie because Arlie and I have been working together on transportation papers. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, when Carrie started telling me about this project that she was doing with Prentice, I just got excited that they were looking into this. So probably sort of, uh, I don't know, invited myself to the party, so to speak, but just really, really excited that this was something they wanted to dig into. I think we all kind of had a similar reaction reading reading the paper from Smart and Klein that we're somewhat reacting to. I was just going to say that, you know, Arlie has written on the location affordability index that HUD developed and was in a special issue of housing policy debate. And so because of his work there, it was also it was a good fit, which Martin Klein had also referenced. He only looked at housing voucher holders in Portland and how transportation costs affected where they could live and how that helped them with their housing costs or not. Yeah, I was just going to build off of that for a little bit, just thinking about this other piece that a lot of times when we have these studies, there's like kind of strong policy implications for this type of work. So part of kind of speaking to the Smart and Klein paper, but also kind of building off of that analysis gets us to create some more nuances in terms of what the policy implications can actually be. And also think about what subgroups are we not talking about when we're doing these studies as well. So the beauty of the PSID, having used it multiple times at this point, is that it gives some great detailed information, but it's also some nuances that are not captured in there. So using it with the H plus T index was really like interesting to kind of think about transportation affordability, but expenditures in a different way outside of one particular space. So I remember when the LHD data came out and I was really excited about that. It sounds like this is another data set that we nerds can get excited about, but it's kind of limited. Can you tell me a little bit about the background of the data set and how hard it is or easy it is to access it? Yeah, I should add that the other reason why Prentice was a perfect fit for this paper I, that I roped him into doing is because he had used the PSID for his dissertation and knew it really well. It is a bit of a hurdle to use this data. It's produced by the University of Michigan as we go over in the paper. It's the longest running longitudinal sample of households in the world. Um, they've been doing it since 1969. But you have to purchase it and you have to work on the data through an enclave, a remote enclave. And you sign several forms and a contract and your university has to approve the use of it and your computer has to be configured correctly so that you can dial into the secure enclave. And then you have to purchase, if you want to get down to the block group level like we did, you have to purchase additional protected data sets. Prentice, do you want to add anything else? The only other piece about it is that 
it was an annually run survey up until I believe 1997, and then they went to biannually. Because of the time frame where we're using the data, we had some kind of great insights in terms of like what we could use from it and what we couldn't. But the other piece is that, you know, with any kind of longitudinal survey, you're getting a lot of characteristics, but some of them are not available in certain years versus others, right? So in certain years, they ask like really in interesting questions like about your mobility plans or intentions and, you know, other years they don't. So part of it was to kind of get a, a fine granular level of data to merge with the CNT data or H plus T index to really get to some of the nuances of uh, transportation expenditures. And one of the amazing things about PSID is that we're often trying to either make assumptions or model the data that is is actually there for us in PSID. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that it is is starting to become used more for this kind of work, despite you know its limitations. It's not you know it's the sample is large, but when you start slicing and dicing into smaller categories or looking at smaller geographies, you do have some limitations, but just that the data itself is actually what we're interested in rather than trying to kind of work backwards into computing the data through other sources. Yeah, I mean, there's a really rich set of questions that they ask each household, but of course, with like all data sets, you do get a lot of blank fields. And the other nice thing is that they work really hard to make it representative of the entire U.S., and Puerto Rico, so you have all 50 states, every major city, as well as rural areas, micropolitan, major MSAs. So we do a pretty thorough comparison of households in the PSID compared to households in the entire U.S. It's not a perfect data set to study very urban areas, especially the diversity of households in urban areas. I think we need to do a better sampling of more homeowner types, broader range of household sizes. Definitely more households of lower and moderate incomes in dense urban areas, and then def- and also have to improve their, their racial and ethnic diversity among households, particularly in urban and what we call mid-urban, so like the older suburban areas. Yeah, that was an interesting part is that you all broke out the data into seemingly four different kind of geographic designations, urban, mid-urban, suburban, and then more rural areas. And then you also found that the data set is also has less urban representation. I'm curious if there's any way to like fix that. I mean, if it's a study that's been going on for so long, it's hard to go back in time necessarily and get people from urban areas from that time period, 1960 is a long, long time ago. I'm not sure how to fix their sampling, except for I think you're required to send them any publication you write. So it would be interesting to follow up with the, because we're all, always enrolling new households. And rightly so, they probably realized at some point that you know much of America lives in these more distant suburbs outside of center cities, that they needed to make sure they were looking at the households in those areas. But in doing that, perhaps they started reducing their sampling in these more urban and mid-urban areas, or maybe it's harder to get respondents in those areas. I also don't think that they, you know, this is kind of a unique geographical grouping that we came up with, and they're probably not looking at it like that. And they probably, you know, said it, uh, we need a proportion from the center city, however they define that, probably more so at the municipal or county level. And then we need to make sure we get a sampling in the rest of the counties. Um, and if you do that proportionally, then maybe they look, maybe their sampling looks correct to them. But if you do it really by the urban grain and form of a place, then you see this oversample of suburban and undersample of suburban and mid-urban. I mean, that brings up another question is, and it's almost the basis for the paper and the, all the research that's been happening over the last few decades about this specific topic is what is the importance of thinking about location and specifically how it relates to affordability or, or even reduced household expenditures? Yeah, I think for me, it's really been kind of interesting to think about a lot of the housing people on the side are just thinking about 30% of your know, monthly income being spent on housing costs. And that is probably like a, a very kind of conservative estimate when we're really thinking about people spending money, where it's like, we know that people are spending energy costs. We know that they're spending transportation costs. And a lot of times those numbers are not taken into consideration when we're thinking about cost burdens for families. So part of a kind of like thinking about this paper, but also in a kind of broader discussion around the literature is to really kind of think about how people actually live within these spaces. And, and to Carrie's point earlier is to really think about in terms of when we think about where people are spatially distributed around different counties and different metro areas, those things change over time. So 
I could easily see us redoing this study in like, you know, five or 10 years and coming out with maybe a different grade of numbers just because the population has shifted more to, you know, the center city and the surrounding regions, where if we think about the PSID starting in the 60s, right, it's a, it's a time period of massive suburbanization. So part of that, that proportioning of different households for this research really is, needs to be understood as very much time dependent and contextually situated. So I would argue that that's part of the reason to do these type of papers is to really kind of think about the nuances of affordability overall, but how do things like housing and transportation fit into a broader narrative around the money that people are spending just to live? And I think there's also a critical just access and equity component to this. You know, my background is in transportation. Most of my research is in transportation, but I've been shifting a little bit more towards the housing side, partly as a recognition that we can't have an accessible, equitable transportation system if we don't allow access to living in places that are well served by transit. And I think that it needs to be something that transportation professionals are thinking about specifically. You know, we can't just leave it to the housers. You know, when we're putting in billion dollar investments, we can't just leave that access, which by definition is a housing question as an afterthought. And I'll add that, you know, one of our one of the key indicators in the model that predicts transportation costs are the location of jobs. And we know in regions, jobs tend to agglomerate and go to the center city and then increasingly to these much, you know, polycentric areas. And we have to look at who can live near those jobs. And if you can't live immediately near those job centers, how can you access them? And is it through long, expensive car rides? Um, I can just at highways, or is it through a range of options? One day you might drive, one day you might take transit. And it's, is it good transit? Is it affordable? Is it you know frequent enough so if you have to leave midday, you can hop on and not only rely on the on good rush hour service? When I was starting my dissertation, one of the authors I read was regional science professor Hagerstrand, and he noted that your access to things, as well as whether or not while you're accessing them, you have to be coupled with somebody else, your daily kind of time space, that activity space you occupy, affects your long range opportunities in life. And so if you, on a daily basis, you can't get to where you need to go, whether it's your children's school, your healthcare, your job, a park for your kids, the grocery store, that daily impact adds up to weekly, monthly, yearly, and then eventually, you know, your overall social mobility and whether or not you can actually have good well-being and get ahead in life. And that was a little bit of also like thinking about the critique of the Smart and Climb paper was that their focus initially was just job access. And there's so many more things that, you know, contribute to access overall, whether it's going to school or the grocery store or all of your activities in daily life. I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, thinking about that in a deeper way is kind of what spurred you on also to a certain extent. Yeah, just the, and Arlie just brought this up, right? I, I would say as like a housing guy, a lot of the times we're speaking in silos in terms of like what families really need. And part of the beauty of this project for me, but also just kind of thinking about these things more from an interdisciplinary nature is to really kind of consider the gaps of the stuff that we don't know. So like transportation is a, a newer area for me, but I've been thinking about it more and more having worked with these two great scholars about the actual piece, but also thinking about what does this really mean when we're designing housing policy and it has no connection to transportation policy. And it tends to be very problematic or, or kind of short-sighted in terms of what people actually need just to live life without some of these burdens that we've been talking about. And I can see that really kind of stretching in different ways when we're thinking about not just housing transportation, but like Carrie and Larry already said, this access to jobs or access to different types of schools. And what does that do to change the trajectory for families in a lower income bracket versus the others, right? Or just kind of how we stratify different social services or public institutions around different neighborhoods to reduce transportation costs or even housing affordability issues. So a lot of it is thinking about branching out to really consider those gaps or nuances that we're not typically talking about within our siloed, more so isolated fields. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some might say that a measure of the number of jobs you can access in 30 minutes by transit could also be a proxy for the services and goods provided by those jobs, if there are those jobs and there's those businesses. But it doesn't get at enough of the other variables that go into determining somebody's daily patterns and how they travel and what else they do with their life. You know, lots of research has shown about all the other urban form variables that we have to consider to really understand what people's travel behaviors 
and decisions because of those complexities that Prentice was just mentioning about other things we have to access. So it doesn't get at whether or not when they do get home from, you know, maybe the transit, the bus that got them to their job in 30 minutes, can they walk then from the bus stop to their child's school on a walkable block and then maybe stop at the park on the way home before they get to their home? Maybe even swing by a place and, and pick up something they need from the store. And so if you can't do that, if you can't trip chain after you get off the bus from your transit to your job, then you might end up driving more often. And so it just is not most a good enough. It's not a holistic measure of all of the um, interactions between the urban environment and a household and how they travel and what they need to do in their life on a daily or weekly basis. Well, so recently also, there's been a lot of data sources that have been coming out related to cell phone and tracking and, and those types of things. I mean, Brookings just came out with a piece that looked at the trip lengths and how urban form impacts that. I think they found that four miles is the average for more urban environments and seven miles for all environments. You know, how much is this new data and new information going to change the way we think about those silos and, and what Prentice was talking about in terms of the individual pieces that need to come together to think about this more holistically? So as, as much as I'm a data person and love data, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for data like you're talking about to help answer some of these, these critical questions, I think there's also a real risk that if it is not looked at with the right amount of nuance and really, you know, as Prentice and Carrie have said, really looking at that kind of individual context of, of either a place or even a family, it's easy with big data to draw either the wrong conclusion or to draw a conclusion that may not be accurate for you know, people that we're really, really trying to make life better for. So I, I'm a bit cautious with some of these efforts, but I think using that kind of in conjunction with either the sort of work that we've been doing, tying in some qualitative methods to actually go verify and validate and talk to people on the ground. So just you know, do that gut check to make sure the big takeaways from the big data sets aren't leading us in the wrong direction. Yeah, I would, I would agree that we have to be careful about using them. There has to be a good analysis of, is it full coverage of all areas in a metropolitan area? Are there big gaps where there is a lack of cell phone towers, where people maybe don't have their phones on all, all day long, people are going on pay as you use your phone? I would just be, yeah, I'd be interested to see what else they know about the cell phone users and that data. At the same time, it can be a nice complementary data set to the traditional ways that regional transportation agencies have collected data on households through these small sample every five or 10 year travel surveys that they try to do through a region, but they're expensive and time consuming to do. They don't reach all of the households and it's often focused on the commute trip. And we know the commute trip is only one of four or five or six or seven trip in a typical household. So maybe the cell phone data can help transportation agencies, the MPOs and the COGS understand this kind of off-peak travel, but again, not to buy into it whole hog <laughs> and not think about what do these big data patterns really mean and then complement it with some more qualitative and focused sampling data. Yeah, to that point, it's funny because like I'm actually trained in policy and not planning. Like I have some planning background for my master's, but the big data push in policy has been big for like the last decade, right? And even as the way we've institutionalized it to like encourage big data or data science as a new area for students to learn, I've been really kind of cognizant and resistant to some of it because a lot of it, even with, you know, bigger data sources, some of the times we're coming out with the same results that we have from other studies as well. So part of my my resistance or fear of it is that we're, we're either using big data to get to the same type of results right? Even if it's just like kind of second guessing or fact checking some of the stuff that we already know. But a, a lot of different times, there's also the sampling issues that you see with it, even in big data. So some of the same issues that we can see from traditional data sets that we're all so used to using, you still see the same type of issues and biases and ethical considerations with big data. So part of it is this kind of this hesitation, as Arlie put it, in a, in a way to really kind of thinking about what big data really is useful for and what are the questions that are not being answered that we can use big data for in the future. And just really quickly, you know, Carrie and I, I think the first project we worked on together was because we were noticing some really important differences in how people respond to their built environment that were obscured when you just looked at averages or if you just looked at a statistical model that 
controlled for household income or race and ethnicity, rather than breaking the model apart and trying to really understand what the effect of those demographic or individual characteristics were. So, you know, just again, to echo that we need to be looking at all of this the right way. And the right way is not always the easy way or the fast way or the way that's going to get your publication out the door the fastest. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought it up and it's relevant. And so we, Arlie's sample was a lot larger for his dissertation. He had households from six different cities. I had 70 families in my study in Oakland. But one of the differences we noticed is that we were not hearing from people that they thought their neighborhoods were walkable, even though walk score would rate their neighborhoods as like very walkable in the 70s and 80s. And you know, we ran statistical tests against our qualitative interview and survey responses from households in our studies against these walk score numbers and found statistically significant differences in these perceptions. And those types of things are buried in big data and will overlook important things for policy, back to Prentice's point about, that need to be addressed if we rely on these large, messy, noisy big data sets. Yeah, and getting into the details, I mean, I, I want to know what those folks who are spending $244,000 on transportation are actually spending it on, or the $50,000, that set of people that you all found. <laughs> like, wh- what are you spending $50,000 annually on transportation? Are you, you have a private jet or what's the deal? Yeah, those are, we, we, we dug into those. We tried to figure it out from other things that they were reporting in there because it tells you how many, you know, whether or not they purchased a car, if they have car payments, how much they're spending on a transit pass. It does include like flights, or maybe it doesn't include airline flights, but it's unclear. I don't know if they're buying two Teslas a year um, <laughs> for flat out for cash. Um, or yeah, what you would what you would spend fifty thousand dollars on. Yeah, or or if it's a mistake. And and you know, that's why we did we did try to clean up some of those outliers that we thought might be that just, just really couldn't be explained. Yeah. So what did you all find from, you know, slicing, dicing the data, cleaning it, putting it together and comparing it with the H plus T data? What did you all find out from your work? We found that urban form does matter. That, of course, some of the same patterns around the, the household characteristics are still the most influential. If you make a lot more income, you are going to spend more on transportation, even if the urban form would allow you to spend less because you can walk for free take transit, hopefully for a lower affordable cost and bite. So we broke households into five income bands, lowest one being 35% of the area median income or less, and the highest being 200% of the area median income or more. And we found that each in each of those income bands, households spent less on transportation costs in urban areas than they did in either mid-urban, suburban, or rural areas. And the savings were enough for all of the households, except for the very lowest income bracket, the 35% AMI, to offset their higher housing costs in the urban areas. And even some of those income brackets in the mid-urban areas, but not enough to offset those. The, you know, in the suburban areas, they were spending a lot on housing and transportation, although some less on housing costs. And for renters, which was the only way we could test the statistical significance for that portion of the study, we found it was significantly different across the urban form categories from urban to suburban. We didn't test the the owner household, the households that own their housing because of the smaller sample size of house ownership in urban areas in the PSID, but also just because of the difference in your housing expenditures that you report if you own your home, given a mortgage and where you are in your mortgage. But in, in a regression model, we also saw that what predicted the, the lower transportation expenditures was the access to good transit and access to jobs, as well as, of course, as the household characteristics. Yeah, just at, a, at sort of the highest level, you know, just generally, I think, consistent findings with this idea of location affordability or housing plus transportation. Again, as to reiterate what Carrie said, except for that one, the lowest income group in the urban areas, the data was consistent, uh, our findings were consistent. And I think that surprised us a little bit, you know, especially because we had, you know, we were following on this paper that had found something very different and things are not always as clear and precise like that as we would like them to be in, in our research findings. But it was a very, very clear pattern that stood out to us, you know, really as soon as we started running the models. 
the other piece that we talked about when we were kind of digging in was this idea a lot of studies tend to be focused on these big kind of metro areas as like singular case studies but when you really think about it the nation is not reflective of that right so if we think about where people actually live a lot of people don't live in densely populated cities and as a result you kind of get these kind of bias estimates when you're including places like New York or other kind of a lot of northeastern cities for that matter really thinking about where people actually live where like even in Atlanta is a more sprawled out kind of nature so part of this idea of like density really kind of matters is to take in consideration that urban form and what it really means and when we just look at where people live is we're more of a nation of kind of suburban or suburban built communities kind of trying to figure out how to urbanize those spaces more so than actually the kind of urban, densely populated cities that tend to dominate a lot of research studies. That's a great point, Prentice. And I think also just thinking in terms of, it's easy to read research about urban form and kind of dismiss it as, oh, they're, you know, they're talking about you know, central city San Francisco or Oakland or New York or you know, th these places that really you know, don't reflect where a lot of people live. And here we're really showing that even in, in some cases, especially in those places that are more, you know, mid-urban to suburban, we are seeing impacts and we're seeing the effects of this trade-off between housing and transportation in a way that, yeah, aligns very well with what has, has been theorized and what others have kind of shown previously. Yeah. And, and since we have the specific data that we analyzed, unlike papers that often think that there are only about six metro areas in the U.S. where you can take transit, we identified that our urban block groups were in 48 counties in 29 consolidated statistical areas. So places people often don't think of, Dallas, the Houston area, the LA area, Miami, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Baltimore, Denver, Salt Lake. Where of course, the density is not as in a, as large of an area and as widespread as you know the six major metros and their transit systems aren't to the level of the New York City subway system, but there are still places in those areas where people live a pretty urban lifestyle, where they're multimodal, they drive some places, they bike and walk and take transit to other places. And so I think it's important for us to think about all these other areas in the, in the country that do offer affordable transportation costs. And with further investment in sidewalks, operational costs for transit, and thinking about where we incentivize jobs to go, that these places could become even more affordable in terms of transportation. So I think that's a good point about the difference in places. I mean, I grew up in suburban Houston, and you know, I had a car when I was 16. I drove everywhere to get everywhere. I mean, I could bike on the trails sometimes when I went to go get baseball cards or whatever. But you know, when I turned 16, it was all car all the time. And then when I moved to San Francisco, I sold my car and I got a Zipcar membership. And so from my ENIC data, your report rings true, but I like that point about it's not just about the big six or the big seven or the big five or whatever that group is of you know really urban places in the United States that don't reflect necessarily the rest of the country. I'm curious how your own ENIC data kind of looked against the research in the study. I grew up in Michigan, so of course... Not in Detroit or the Motor City, but it's definitely a motorized state. And But when I went to Ann Arbor, I, I lived there for four years without a car and got around everywhere I needed to go just fine. And then I moved to San Francisco without a car and then to Chicago for 10 years without a car, back to California without a car. And I even lived in Denver for four years without a car. I needed, of course, to have two car share memberships <laughs> in order to get to places I was doing research for interviews and to observe those places. But I, I now have a car here, but I still hardly use it. My insurance company has one of those trackers where they give you a lower rate if you don't drive that much. And in the beginning, they kept sending me messages that I had it turned off and I better send them a photo of my mileage because they didn't believe I was driving that little. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've only put a few thousand miles on in the last couple of years, and that includes trips to the mountains. And the only thing I would add from personal perspective is, you know, I've had the, the luxury and the privilege of every, every place I've lived being able to really factor in transportation. I mean, partly because I think about transportation a lot in a professional sense, and also being able to do so in a way and in places where I could afford to do so. And in fact, you know, where I am now, being able to afford to do so and probably paying 
less of my income in a mortgage than I should based on the sort of affordability metrics. That in itself, you know, I think is is a sign that, that this data is so complicated and, and you know, we, we can think about the 30% being affordable, but the bottom line, some people are having to spend a lot more than that because they have to. Um, and other people have the luxury of being able to, you know, try to find housing that is going to um, be saving saving them money. Um, so it's not not a clear cut picture. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Arlie. And that's, you know, that's why I continue to like this line of research is, I'm very lucky that I can live in the location that I do, just east of downtown Denver, not far from my job, surrounded by grocery stores, halfway between two parks that are less, less than a half mile walking distance from me, like major city parks. It's a prime location. and I fortunately can't afford to live here. I couldn't now if I had to buy because of the price increases in the last seven years. But so many people cannot look at a map and say, I want to live here because it's near my job. It has all these things that I want to live near because our housing has become so unaffordable. And then they take on these high transportation costs in other parts of the region where they can find affordable housing. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I'm, I'm probably like the worst case example in terms of transportation since I have moved a lot. And I've also made probably not the best kind of rational decisions in terms of like reducing costs just purely based on housing and transportation affordability. But I, I, I do think that part of this kind of narrative or a lot of the ways in which the research is shaped brings us back to the point earlier in terms of like thinking about subjective kind of measures of how people actually live their lives, right? And the, the importance of really kind of getting a daily experience or a voice to the, a lot of the, the big data questions or even the kind of these other research projects were kind of tend to lack. Like I chose to live in Denver, but I worked in Colorado Springs and I d- drove the most I've ever driven in my life for those kind of four years going back and forth just for the idea that I could be in a bigger city in a more diverse kind of community where I didn't feel like I had that same type of opportunity in Colorado Springs. But that was a choice to like be on the road every day for at least an hour, right? So there's, there's kind of these trade-offs that tend to fit outside of kind of rational choice economic arguments about spending patterns that technically our paper doesn't deal with specifically, but it also gives some insights in terms of like those intersections between kind of household dynamics and the urban form or the built environment. And it's just kind of thinking through critically, we've had several conversations about this when we were analyzing the data, trying to understand the, the kind of results, but are they proxies for something else, right? So it's not just about having children, it's about the lived practice of having children and what does that do to change your transportation patterns or your travel behavior overall. And kind of thinking critically about when we use data or a specific measure for something, are we really accounting for everything that that measure actually brings to the table? Or is it more of a proxy for some type of other lived experience that we're just not defining in the paper specifically? Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that term household dynamics, Prentice, because, you know, for years I've used household characteristics and I really liked the, you know, calling it dynamics the way Prentice does because families are very dynamic. You know, it's not just about their income and their size and these two very generic measures. And what we cannot really go into as much through the PSID, even though there's many variables of the family, are just how those like variables interact and play out each day. And so we, Prentice and I, when we first started on this project, we looked through the huge, you know, hundreds of variable list in the PSID data set that we were going to use. And we selected all of these household variables, like really fine grained things about, you know, every household member and each person and how much they worked. And we did end up using much of that, but there's so much more that if this were like a sample of maybe a hundred thousand people we could have really gotten into some of those other, possibly those other subjective decisions and interactions among, you know, a household with two children versus four children, four small children versus four adult children. (laughs) Yeah, so that still, I think, is left to be explored some more. And we have to realize that as planners, that families are very different based on all kinds of things that a lot of these data sets don't capture. I want to go back and ask about that group that's below 35% of a very median income, because that was the one that didn't quite fit into the pattern that you saw with everyone else. You know, when I read the paper, I kept on thinking about the loss of ridership in a place like Los Angeles or, you know, ridership loss for transit around the country and trying to imagine, and I think it's been discussed to a certain extent, but imagine what that means in terms of housing, in terms of where people are going. 
and thinking about that lower income group who are often, you know, the folks that in places like Los Angeles, where I think a huge proportion of the ridership comes from low income people. But if you're pushed out of your neighborhood, it might lead to the reduction in, in ridership. So I'm curious about if you all had any thoughts when that came up, that 35% of area median income or below, and how that didn't quite fit, and, and if that led to anything else that, that crossed your mind in, in that respect. So yeah, I would say that I think there's definitely a sort of displacement gentrification piece to that, as you just suggested. And I, and I think that some of the digging into the ridership losses in LA and Portland elsewhere, yeah, definitely are showing, you know, when people who are regular transit riders can no longer afford to live near transit, we are going to see ridership decreases. And I think the other piece of this on the housing side, and I think we say this in the paper, is that that's also, you know, the population that really does need subsidy to be able to live in places where otherwise not, might not be able to afford, whether that's through the development of affordable housing, you know, through the low income housing tax credit program, or whether it's through the housing choice voucher program, you know, both of those programs are only meeting a tiny fraction of demand for subsidy. And so it's clear, I think, and I think also shown in the data that we're not keeping up with the need there. So I think there's both the transportation and a, and a housing side to the story, and both are really, you know, critical and need a policy response, need an investment. And I think that one of the key questions is how well those investments, even if they happen, how well they'll be coordinated across transportation and housing. You know, there there are those that I think criticize the kind of work that we're doing, assuming that we're trying to like achieve our transit ridership goals or achieve our carbon reduction goals based on low income people using transit. And I think that the key to this whole story is trying to provide choice for people to do what works best for them. And I think that comes through in the data that we have that there, where we need to be making investments, where we need to be making interventions is those places where people are not able to make those choices. And, you know, we, we can only look at that so much with this data, but I think we want to make it clear that we're trying to increase opportunities for choice rather than try to, you know, get certain parts of the population to only live a certain way. People should have different mode choices available for all the different places they have to go. It's when they're tied to only a car or only transit that they're really limited. It's either going to cost them a lot or be pretty time intensive and limit where they can go. We're not trying to be physical, have physical determinism here, where this you know, the physical environment dictates how you travel, but it can support multiple options of design correctly, you know, with a lot of different uses and you know, a lot of transportation options readily and easily available to use. Yeah, I've been thinking about this too, in, in terms of, you know, we keep talking about urban form and a built environment. But the kind of normative assumption that the infrastructure for these spaces have been built years ago, right? So like as places are changing their population or demographics, there's going to be a point where the public infrastructure doesn't match the needs of local residents, right? So when there's a, tons of studies that are talking about the suburbanization of poverty. And that was something else we were talking about when we were analyzing data is just, yeah, a lot of the kind of metrics that we're talking about in terms of transportation affordability, but also just travel behavior. One is this kind of story Arlie kind of mentioned and you suggested about the, the changing role of the neighborhood level, right, or the changing communities. But the two, the other piece is just like how people just don't have access just because they've been pushed out. So it creates this kind of bifurcated system in terms of transit where normally one person might be more reliant on, you know, an underground transit system or a train system, where now they're, they're left to the whims of just a bus routes. They're taking multiple bus routes just to get to the same job that they've had before and after that move. So we've been thinking about a lot of times in which we're, we're kind of understanding the built environment is specific, very much time dependent on like how people are actually using those, those spaces and really kind of making us or forcing us to kind of deal with the issue that in the future, maybe we have to really drastically rethink what it means to have a, a public transit system and do we need to rely more on subsidies in one particular space just because the, there's not enough political will to build a new transit line? Or are there other kind of ways and nuances that we can create policies to kind of alleviate some of those financial burdens for families? Yeah, I mean, we we looked at this group as well as the group just above it, 65% of the area median income a lot, especially when we started taking the percentages that their housing costs and transportation costs were of their total income. And thinking about, you know, how, how do you afford anything else if the combined cost of those two is 90% of your income? 
And also the, the often at a very in, low income level, households tend to have less um, stable employment. And that's, this group is very diverse. So you can't make that assumption about everyone in that income level that they're going from job to job and having some bouts of unemployment. Some may be working at the same low wage job every day for hours, you know, longer, more than 40 hours a week. But for that group where they have a much more, you know, unstable income, having to have a stable requirement of a car payment and gas every time you need to get into it and go somewhere makes it even more difficult to rely on a car as your only means of transportation. And so really thinking about when we're allocating scarce public dollars for investments in housing and transportation, you know, like what Prentice was just saying is, where do we really need to put much more subsidy in both of those infrastructure investments, housing and transportation and other things in the schools? Because of the scarcity of resources at the household level, they definitely are not surviving at those incomes and not to a state where they can live a healthy, high quality life if all their money is just going to two of those items in their entire household set of needs that they have to spend money on. And to that point, it's, it's fairly interesting. I have a colleague here, John Paul Addy, and he's a critical theorist trained as a geographer. And it's funny because we had this same kind of conversation because he does a lot of kind of theoretical conceptual work on critical infrastructure. And we had the same kind of conversation where housing is not considered critical infrastructure within these spaces. So it's just it's just another kind of piece in terms of like, and when we think about infrastructure, we tend to forget about some of the commodities that we we structure around places that kind of meet or, or kind of interact with, with with the normal kind of infrastructure piece without thinking of it as like a, a holistic system to really provide some of these like basic services that everybody needs. As Arlie and Carrie were mentioning with housing, you know, when we think about the, the element of schools in this case as well, in terms of like really dictating or changing travel behavior more specifically, but also kind of really encompassing what do people need to actually live sustainable lives. And then and the piece in terms of this is around really kind of re-articulating the need for, you know, policy alleviation strategies or subsidies within these kind of core areas of housing and transportation. But also we need a more kind of central understanding of what people actually need on their daily lives and how they're interconnected. And that I would hope that part of this conversation getting pushed forward is to think about not just transportation or not just housing, but how they have to be mutually dependent and coexist when we're thinking about suitable policy solutions. Harry, I'm really glad that you said that the way you did, that housing is infrastructure. And when we're thinking about urban space and we're thinking about planning and we're thinking about policy, I mean, it sounds kind of cold in a way to think about housing as infrastructure, but it, you know, in the same way that transportation, you know, serves an absolutely critical need for people to live their daily lives, you know, housing right there. I think, you know, thinking about them both in, in that kind of infrastructure investment world is an important part of moving this conversation forward. Right. I think, you know, that was something we often talked about seeing at CNT when we were uh, thinking about this housing and transportation affordability index is it's very important to raise incomes. So one side of the equation, but also important to reduce expenditures and costs for households. And it's got to be a dual prong strategy. We have to be lowering costs and raising incomes at the same time. Sounds similar to like an energy efficiency strategy as well, right? Trying to do better at, at being more efficient, but also increase the amount of renewable energy that you have, kind of a, <laughs> to try to make some sort of an analogy. Yeah, except in this case, it's across more sectors and different right. silos and yeah, different federal agencies. Yeah. I have one more question for you. When you all finished the paper, what stood out the most to each of you individually? I mean, what was the thing that kind of popped and, and uh, maybe blew your mind a little bit? I have a couple quick thoughts. So after we rolled out the H plus T index, a lot of metro areas decided that they were going to adopt it as a benchmark in, in their regional planning documents. And But over time, since that was now 15 years ago, some of the regional planning agencies have begun to, begun to question, like, is this really a good tool that we can use to benchmark our regional planning investments against? You know, they're, they were setting goals that households in a region should spend less than 45% of their income on housing and transportation. Pieces like Smart and Klein's critique of location affordability, that it's not that strong of a relationship with urban form and that it's more about household characteristics can help start to, you know, erode policymakers' confidence in the ability to 
lower people's transportation costs through their public investments. I hope that this article shows that it, the urban forum relationship is there. And at the same time, what it also shows is there are not enough places where people can lower their costs. And what's a promising policy strategy that some regions have been adopting for at least the last 10 years, if not longer, are these priority areas where you're going to both improve the urban areas, but also bring up some of these mid-urban areas so that they can be more livable and walkable. And so greater investments in those inner ring suburbs of more frequent transit, more bus lines, breaking through some of those cul-de-sacs with walking paths and bike lanes. Westminster is a suburban example where they're doing a huge bike lane expansion uh, with the idea, and they're doing it using an equity policy tool to see which neighborhoods could be most benefited by you know increase in bike lanes, safer, safer sidewalks, or the presence of sidewalks instead of no sidewalks. So I think this paper, to me, showed that regional planning agencies' interest in transportation cost model is still valid. Yeah, I think for me, part of the piece, and Carrie and I talked about this earlier on, and when we all kind of met up in Denver a few times, re- kind of really thinking about it, part of it, we were actually surprised that PSID didn't have a huger or a larger representation of urban households. And we talked about it before in that kind of conversation that, it, well, it is kind of maybe more re- reflective of where people actually live, but given the, the demographic changes and the shifts in population back in the center cities, Part of the question I was really kind of toying around when we like decided to, you know, measure certain variables in, in particular ways is to account for some of this variability or variation in terms of households, but also kind of attending to the consideration that we still need to know more about like urban areas in a, a very much broader way. I think part of this kind of situation where places are changing, I think it was last fall when we were kind of working on other aspects of the paper. And I was in Toronto at the time, but seeing like they have a a very kind of different approach to transportation where, you know, the cultural practices of bike riding are very high there. There's a strong public transit system, but also, you know, a ton of people still drive every day. So kind of really thinking about this issue of like density and population shifts uh, largely increased. And even the piece that Carrie and Arlie brought up earlier in relation to jobs, I would argue that a lot of times we kind of treat jobs and incomes as this is climbing like property values. And we know that's just not the case for a lot of families. So really kind of taking into consideration like, all right, here are the household characteristics or dynamics as we're seeing them. And when you kind of interact those or kind of put those in conversation with the urban form, you still see that certain urban form kind of characteristics actually have an effect on curbing some of these transportation expenditures, even when you're controlling for a rising housing costs or just housing costs overall. So part of this piece is kind of really think about the data that we were using a little bit more critically in terms of producing these results, but also what kind of effects in terms of transportation, I think broader than just housing and transportation, but what are the kind of realistic policy outcomes in terms of intervening in families today, but also in the future. And I, I don't think you can have a conversation about an either or approach where you got to do both and to really get to the critical question of how to kind of address some of these issues. When we were finishing the paper, I was struck by how this sort of these mid-urban areas, as, as we called them, sort of the you know older suburban locations, how they stood out both as as having some real opportunities for you know changing what we're seeing, but also some real challenges in terms of not having necessarily the most supportive built environments and having a fair amount of poverty located in them. And so that that stood out at the time, but more so, and I think it's significant because those are also places where we have, in a lot of regions, a lot of fragmentation in terms of government. You know, we've got, you know, smaller suburban just jurisdictions. Think about a place like, you know, Minneapolis, where you've got all these suburban jurisdictions right outside of the city of Minneapolis. You know, cities around the country have a similar setup. You know, we've got Ferguson, Missouri, probably being in this category, places with some real challenges that we've seen over the years. And more recently, and we were talking about this earlier, but more recently, the sort of outsized role that these same places have played in the most recent election, these suburban jurisdictions outside of Atlanta, outside of Detroit, 
outside of Phoenix. There's a lot of change happening in these places politically, but also with urban form. And I think some real opportunities to look at these places that are sometimes overlooked by urban planners and really figure out what sorts of investments, coordinated investments can be made to really make these places more affordable and have that infrastructure that can support people's lives. If somebody wanted to get a, a hold of the paper and read it, where where can they find it? It was published in Housing Policy Debate, so it's available on their website. I also have posted my, I have a number of, we each got an allocation of free reprints, so they can email us individually for a, one of those links so they can download it for free and get beyond the paywall of the journal, unless they already have access to their, their university or some other paid source. Awesome. Well, I hope folks get a chance to take a look at it, to read it. And I appreciate you all for coming on. Thanks, Carrie and Prentice and Arlie for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sha. It's a good discussion. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod, you know, patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. See you next time at Talking Headways. <laughs>